Namaste. Well, if I went into every little point that's obscure in the Vedanta Sutras or in Brahma Sutras, every video would be like an hour and a half long and nobody would watch it. <laughs> in fact, the average view of my typically 15 minute videos is only like six minutes, you know. So people aren't even watching half. But there's one that has come up that I just can't let go. And that is the statement that the enlightened being leaves the body via the 101st nerve. That there are 100 nerves coming out of the heart and that, you know, one of them goes to the top of the head. And, of course, somebody or some people are going to take that literally and think, oh, this Vedic knowledge is no good because they say there's only a hundred nerves in the heart and who can count them anyway and where are these nerves and blah, blah, blah. blah. Where's the proof, right? Well, the proof is that if you follow the instructions, you can find that special nerve that goes to the top of the head. But prior to that, the understanding of this sutra is that there are many nerves. A hundred is just like an arbitrary number. That, yeah, there's a hundred nerves coming out of the heart. And these are not exactly the same as our Western physical science or medicine calls nerves. Huh? That's a bad translation, or how can I say, a very inaccurate translation of the Sanskrit nadi. Nadi actually means something like a subtle energy vesicle or something like that. They are part of the anatomy of the subtle body, the pranamaya kosha. They are the channels along which the life energy, the prana, flows from one chakra to another. So this is something we don't go into deeply in our series because, you know, it doesn't really help you materially progress along the spiritual path. Uh, the Ayurveda scriptures say there are 72,000 nadis in the human body. And I'm pretty sure that is also uh, just an approximate number because who can count them all, right? You know, there's probably some mathematical calculation, seven times seven times 100 or something like that, you know, to come up with that number. But actually, they're uncountable. Because energy will find a way. Energy always has to move. It can never remain still or it becomes matter. And so because the energy in the subtle body is constantly in motion, really nobody can measure or nobody can count the possible paths that it has between one chakra and another. But still the point remains. One of these nadis, called the Sushumna nadi, goes from the heart, which is the abode of the soul, to the top of the head, the Brahmarandra, as it's called. There's a hole in the skull right here. You can feel it. It's like right where the, uh, the hairs begin to grow out in a circular pattern. Huh? That is the Brahmarandra. And I was reading in the biography of one of my predecessor gurus of my Adi guru, Bhaktivinoda Thakur. And when he was a young boy, he had seen one of the local brahmanas leave his body by means of this Brahmarandra. And basically a big hole opened up in the top of his skull. Of course, medical science doesn't know anything about this because even if they observed something like it, they would dismiss it as an anomaly. It does not fit 
in their description of the world, their ontology. So whatever doesn't fit in their ontology, their dualistic notion of material reality of everything, they tend to discount it and suppress the evidence. Just like in archaeology, when an archaeologist or a student working under an archaeologist finds an anomalous uh, piece of pot shard or something in a stratum where, according to their theory, it can't possibly exist, well, they just suppress the reports. I have been told this directly, personally, by several archaeology students. When I was touring with a friend of mine, Druta Karmadas, who was lecturing at universities about ancient Vedic history in the Puranas, and how in those days, thousands of years ago, they had subtle and powerful machines and weapons and airplanes and all kinds of stuff. And they were coming and telling. There was one coal mine, I believe it was, in uh, you know Tennessee or West Virginia or someplace like that, where they discovered mechanical constructions in this vein of coal that was at least... 150 or 300 million years old, according to their dating uh, methods. So, of course, the whole thing just got covered up. You'll never hear about it, huh? It goes in the X-Files and gets buried in some warehouse. <laughs> and nobody ever hears about it again. And, of course, anybody that makes a fuss about it will just sort of quietly disappear or, you know. Whatever happens to people like that, who knows? But those who observe these anomalous phenomena are suppressed so that they don't threaten the dominant story, the narrative that we are fed uh, by force in school about, you know, the uh, recency of scientific knowledge or technology, or uh, the fact that civilizations existed long ago that were far more advanced than ours, especially in terms of humanities and spiritual knowledge. But, I mean, this is obvious to anybody who really studies it. For example, Vedic music. Vedic music is extremely sophisticated, you know, there's, there's no way this kind of music could have evolved in a community of proto-humans living in grass huts or caves, you know? I mean, there's only so many ways you can bang two stones together, right? So how did the sophisticated melodies and, and deep harmonies of the justly intoned scales used by the ragas develop? Not by, you know, some ape-like creatures sitting in a cave, banging their heads against the stone or whatever. <laughs> That's complete nonsense. But this is the kind of nonsense that we are fed in school. Because they cannot admit that our civilization is simply the latest and possibly the least great of all the great civilizations that have existed down through time. And actually, our civilization, so-called, huh? Gandhi one time was asked, what do you think of Western civilization? And his reply was, I think it would be a good idea. In other words, they're not civilized by his standards because they're killing cows, they're killing themselves with drugs, they're killing each other in these great wars that have absolutely no utility, absolutely no significance, other than the clash of egos of these big leaders, state leaders, and so on. So when you read something in the Vedas, to get the correct meaning, you have to put it in context. I never tire of saying context creates meaning. And so if something appears to be questionable, one of the first things you have to do is look into the context. 
Is it being stated just in passing, as a reference to some other scripture? Is it merely a figure of speech, like a hundred nerves coming out of the heart? Or is it factual, meant to be taken literally? You see, you have to do your homework. You have to look into all these things, or you're left with more questions than you started with when you research the scriptures. So I just wanted to tell you that, because there are countless other topics I could go into in depth and come up with, you know, different references and stuff like that. But is anybody really going to listen to it? Is anybody really going to learn from it? So I just go on with the, you know, the basic commentary on the scriptures, the sutras, and their commentary by Shankara. Because actually, if you believe it, if you follow it, that is enough to attain the highest enlightenment, realization of Brahman. Aum Tatsa, Aum Shakti Aum, Aum Namah Shivaya.